please welcome Alex Schwartz and Devin Raymer from Alchemy Labs. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out to the Wild West of VR talk here. Um, let's get it started. My name is Alex Schwartz, and I'm the chief scientist, founder, and CEO of Alchemy Labs, also sometimes janitor. With a small uh, indie game studio, you kind of have to do it all. And I'm uh, Devin Reimer. I am CTO, or as we call it, chief technical owl and resident Canadian at Alchemy Labs. And uh, here's a photo of our uh, office, the, the labs themselves. Um, just a really quick overview of the games that we did leading up to what we're about to talk about. Um, our first game was called Snuggle Truck. Has anyone heard of that game? Okay, I just wanted to get applause for yeah. us, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Snuggle Truck is a, a game about uh, a bunch of stuffed animals in the uh, a purple rusty truck driving over the border to give those stuffed animals free health care. <laughs> and um, that garnered us some awards. Um, we were very proud of, of that. And uh, Yeah, the next game we did uh, was Jack Lumber. You play a supernatural lumberjack that is out for revenge on the forest because a tree killed your granny. And it also won some awards. <laughs> Uh, so recently, we had a successful Kickstarter of a game called Discourse. It's a uh, psychological uh, narrative survival game where you play uh, a character and a bunch of misfits that crash landed on a deserted island. And uh, we also worked on a game called Ah for the Awesome, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So um, this is a screenshot of Ah for the Awesome. It garnered uh, great um, reviews, and we're very happy about how that worked out. Um, some quick background, Ah, the original game was called A Reckless Disregard for Gravity, and that was created by Deja Bond Games. Uh, that was an IGF nominee in design, and it was a PC-only game. Uh, and we came in, and uh, we worked with Deja Bond to create, we collaborated to make, to make this semi-sequel called Ah for the Awesome. So we basically uh, ripped it apart, brought it into Unity, uh, and made the Mac and iOS and Android and Linux ports of the game. Um, we also worked together to bring new levels and mechanics to the game. Um, and you know why did we do this? Uh, basically, when the Kickstarter for Oculus Rift uh, was first announced, we looked at the fact that we had this base jumping VR game, and we said, this, this has to be ported. We have to try it. Um, and the thing is, we started seeing articles um, before we had announced or said or even decided that we wanted to do anything, saying, I would buy a Rift just for this game. Or uh, you know, RPS was writing about how it's going to be ported. And we're like, we didn't even. How we're now on the line to do this, you know, um, but we, we really wanted to do it. Um, and you can see here, uh, bottom left, there's kind of a um, little gameplay footage of uh, Oculus. And uh, so, yeah, that's, how, that's what we came up with, um, Oculus, the uh, Oculus edition. Uh, we announced it in July of last year, and um, we brought it to Steam, and uh, our, it's commercially available on Steam for PC, Mac, and Linux, and that launched uh, in August. Um, it's also uh, when Oculus Share was announced, um, we put uh, on there, and it's the top download game on Oculus Share, so we're super thrilled about that. Um, so as far as the timeline, it was two people, us, uh, working one day to do the Oculus integration. And that got it to the point where you could look around and, uh, you know, with the head-mounted display. Uh, but it took another month to have it feel good. From a user experience point of view, um, that was, you know, our trials, and that's what we're going to be talking about is that month of making it try to feel as good as possible. All right, so this is the meat of the talk here. So uh, this, we call this talk the Wild West of VR, and there's a reason for that. The rules haven't been written yet. Very rarely does something happen where there's literally no rules written, and you have to figure out as you're going along. Um, something I find very helpful is looking back to the last time that rules haven't been written, and uh, we, I think it's this. It's um, this is the keynote when they're showing off the iPhone for the first time. I don't know if you can hear that. Anyway, so he's showing off Unlock slide the phone, to I unlock. I just take my finger and slide so, it across. All right, you want to see that again? Go to sleep. That's hilarious, right? Like everyone's like, yes, this is the greatest thing ever. But that's essentially it. The Boom. rules hadn't been written yet, and they figured out the great implementation for that. Right. And so, you know, we all laughed when we saw that everyone was cheering and the standing ovation for this, you know, slide to unlock. But as the great Albert Einstein never said, obvious is not obvious when you're thinking about it for the first time. So uh, we're basically going over what did we learn during this, you know, one-month period, and we're just going to go through all the things uh, that weren't obvious. 
So uh, to start off, uh, there's been some talk about already, yeah, motion sickness, this, uh, disagreement between your visual perception and the vestibular system. This is a huge thing to deal with. Uh, and like, the reason is that people think that might be an evolutionary process where if you ingest an hallucinogenics, that means your vision and your perception is all messed up and you need to vomit because then you would live. So people that get motion sick, don't worry, you evolved better than people like I did. Um, so just quickly break that down. Uh, it's like if you get car sick, what's happening is you have actual motion, but you're perceiving nothing moving. And then the flip side of that is that if you perceive motion and you're actually stationary, and so that's a big part in uh, VR motion sickness. So one of the really interesting things was people were clamoring, they're like, we need this game in VR. And every comment was, they'd say that, and the next person says, yeah, but do you want to vomit? And I was like, okay, well, maybe we can actually do something about it. And it's pretty crazy that we've got to the point when we ship this that we get emails and people talking to us saying that this is the least motion sick they've ever got in a piece of VR content, which is crazy because it's essentially you're jumping off of a building. And so we're going to go through some of the things that we ended up doing to kind of crack that nut a bit. All right, so the first one has been covered, uh, Palmer mentioned, um, basically you cannot override the look direction of the, the head-mounted display. So if the, the player's looking around and then the game says, hey, I'm going to override your, your look direction and, and turn you or camera shake or tumble, uh, it's instant nausea-inducing. And we saw that. That was right off the bat, day one, as we got into the game. Like you saw there in that video at the end, just when you land and parachute safely to the ground, it does this kind of slow turning motion and it's just you have to rip off the headset and you feel gross right so we have to turn off the cam tumble we have to turn off the feedback that's given when you smack into a building and the shake we had to uh you know change a lot of that around um and one of the key things we found and, and this was really interesting about uh building a game where you have to kind of look off the edge of a building is so when you start out you, you, you you're standing on top of a building right and you could look up and the, the clouds are above you and you can walk over to the edge and look down and see the city below right up is up, down is down in the real world. Now, um, the problem is when we started developing it, we would play the game and we'd have to look down and our, you know, we'd have to arch our back and, and our neck would have to hang down. Uh, and it, it was instant neck pain. And so the thing is we figured out the brain can be tricked and you don't have to be looking straight down IRL to actually feel like you're looking straight down in VR. And so I'll explain that with a little animation here. So we started out, down was down when you were flying through the city. And then we said, what if we just make it so that they don't actually have to look down physically? Let's just make it so that forward, so you're sitting here sitting in a chair looking forward, let's just make that the down direction in the game. But the problem is, you feel like you're flying through a tunnel forward like Superman. And so you don't get that sense of falling down. So what we did is we came up with this interesting happy medium where we ended up changing the entire coordinate system um, on the fly down to a, like a downward 45 degree angle after you've left the building. So you're sitting there, one to one, clouds are up, ground is down. And when you leave the edge of the building, that moment of kind of like accelerating to terminal velocity and that leaving the edge of the building, we do kind of a, a quick turn downward. And it's interesting because your eyes end up following that downward turn. Yeah, it's just uh, like it's, this it's natural really thing. It's like I expected I would like look and then it would move and then I'd go, ooh, I'm really sick. But as soon as it starts gradually going down, your eyes just follow it down. Right. And the very interesting thing we ended up finding is the vestibular system is pretty good at kind of orienting you a bit. But if you go and you tilt your head forward, your vestibular system says, okay, I'm kind of looking down. But then if you feed data in that says I'm looking straight down, that's, that kind of is the overriding thing. Right. And so the really cool thing is we put, put this on, people play the game, we take it off, and we say, okay, how were you sitting when you were falling straight down? And people go, oh, I was like, and then they're like, oh, wait a second, I wasn't yeah. like that at all. They would uh, swear they were looking at their feet, 100%, yet they were not at all. Yeah. Um, and we pull them out of that downward 45 orientation correction mode when they pull the parachute. So you're falling and you're falling, and then when you finally parachute, it, you know, the, the jerk of the motion of a parachute pulling you up is kind of expected, and that's when we bring it back to that one-to-one -one mapping of orientation so that they can safely land, and then they're looking, when they land, they can look around, and the sky is up, and feet are down. And so it's almost like it never happened. Yeah, so it's really interesting to think about we're fighting against motion sickness a lot, but maybe there's some things in here that we can leverage as advantages. Mm -hmm. um, so the next thing is VR legs. Uh, Dean at Valve, he told me this term for the first time, and I was like, that's awesome, and I have to use it everywhere. Um, so essentially, it means that you've kind of developed a tolerance over time. 
Um, for development, this is actually really bad. Uh, so the old developer fallacy is that I've played my game for seven months and I'm really good at it, but I think it's perfect difficulty. And I give it to somebody and they're like, this is the hardest game I've ever played. Uh, so essentially you have the same thing. It's like I've been playing this game in VR for a month and it's good, no motion sickness. Um, that's not correct. So what we have to do is a lot of time, make sure we get new people in to try it for the first time and see if we've just got used to something or it actually makes people people comfortable. Yeah. So this ended up being a huge time sink. Uh, it's something you don't think of right away, but menus are incredibly important and incredibly hard to do in VR. So this is the menu uh, we have in AH. Um, so essentially you see something like this in VR because this is on your peripheral vision. Um, as you see, it loses most of the buttons, most of the text, and becomes completely unusable. So here are the problem areas, which is essentially the entire menu. Um, so we ended up having to rework the whole thing, and it ended up being a lot of time, but uh, we're super glad that we did it. So, so what we ended up doing is taking a render texture, putting it as a plane, snap to your camera, but we have this entire world behind it that moves when you look around, and uh, we do things like when you mouse over text, or buttons, it, they, they grow in size. So this helped on the DK1 version because the resolution is so low that simply mousing over that text makes it readable, but then it right. sucks back in to fit in that size. But it's really just the bare, bare minimum of usability. That's oh, yes. where we are. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's pretty funny because a lot of people are like, this is the best menu system I have ever seen in VR. I could get in and I could play my game, and I'm like, that's a sad state of affairs. Um, <laughs> The thing that it's just done so poorly up to now that this looked like a triumph simply because it was remotely usable. Um, so where do we go from here? What makes a good VR menu? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's some cool things in 3D spatial arrangement menus. Uh, Riff Racer is the first game that I've seen that kind of does this a little bit. Um, if you, uh, you're looking straight forward, you look up and down to cycle through your menus, but then you have optional menus that you rarely use on the left and right, right? quits over here, and you just look at it, and, it, and it, that kind of works. We need to do a lot of uh, research and kind of figuring out what to do here. Right. But as Palmer said, you want to avoid that fatigue of having to look behind you to check your ammo every 10 seconds. So, you know. So the next one was HUD. Okay, so this is a screenshot. Uh, I think you can probably guess by that other image what's going to be problematic here. <laughs> Everything. Um, so we were trying to investigate how we could make this work. And we came to this conclusion, as, uh, as Palmer said, destroy all HUDs, just get rid of them if you can. Uh, and there's a few places where we left them in for notification messages, but we put them right in the middle of your view, make it really quick, and just fade it away as quickly as possible. Because you break immersion the moment you put anything over top. We want this to be a very visceral experience. So we ended up relying on audio cues a lot. So like bird strikes, um, when you're flying inside buildings, when you're doing hugs and kisses, it makes noises, and you can hear that. I think with VR, you're going to have to uh, rely on audio a lot more than we have in the past. So to convey more complicated pieces of data, uh, contextual UI is always uh, always better. Uh, so here's Dead Space. Dead Space is an incredible job of this. Um, it is overlooked, but it is done so well. Like, so for example, there's an inventory there. That's completely inside the field of view. We have your health, your status, and your weapon ammo. Uh, as Palmer's saying, like, that is the way that we need to do things. So this is a great game to take context from. So yes, 3D in-game representations of data. And next is controllers are very, very essential to VR. Uh, so like when you're like VR and you're like, oh, where's my keys on my keyboard? That makes for a terrible experience because you end up the entire time lifting up the rift a little bit and it's like, yeah, that's the worst thing ever. So yes, controllers are really important to the experience. Yeah, so we've been talking about the player facing uh, user experience type stuff, but it's interesting to talk about what about the developers, right? Um, so there's a lot of problems currently, the, a lot of fatigue and things like that in VR development. So this was pretty much a month solid of us developing every day. And um, you know, I wear glasses and I choose to not wear glasses in the Rift. So basically switching context between looking at your screen to code something and then testing it out inc uh, you know, requires you to take the glasses off, take the Rift, put it on. Take the Rift off, put the glasses back on, do something, put it back on. Then your hair has a little grease in it, it gets on the lenses and it's just like, it's such a, it's very hard to continuously change context and it's almost like getting a new pair of glasses and you know how you get a little headache when you, you change lenses. Imagine having to wear a different pair of glasses every 10 minutes. 
So, um, and the other thing is uh, we had these interesting developer bugs. Usually a bug is not going to cause you physical distress, but we had these problems where um, we had, you know, in the Oculus dual camera setup, we had something where we had accidentally only done a render texture, or some kind of like a bloom effect on one eye, but not on the other. And it's really hard to tell what the problem is. You just know something feels wrong. And you're looking around and you, you just, it, you can't tell what the bug is. It's, it's bad because we took like screenshots of it and you're looking at a flat screenshot and you're like, I don't see it. And then you put it on, you're like, whoa. Yeah. So yeah, we actually got to a point in development of this game that we both had to take the day off because we gave ourselves so bad of headaches and eye strain and we're like, whoa, we just need to stop. And then we took a day off and then, okay, no, we're back and then we can go again. But we were just building our VR legs, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, so another thing just just for people that are developing anything in, uh, you know, for Oculus, if you're using, the un uh, using Unity to do it, uh, watch out for using the Maximize in Editor to test your content because it actually currently, until they fix it, it has borders on the edge, so you're getting about 95% of the screen, not 100% of the screen, which means that the optics are slightly, you know, the, the render textures are slightly misaligned and it's slightly off and it, it doesn't represent the actual scale and uh, final use of what it looks like in a real build, so you have to continuously do standalone builds to make sure that you're doing this, you know, doing it yeah, right. And I use it a lot because it makes iteration really fast, but I just got to be careful and cognizant that I'm going to give myself a headache if I do this too much. Right. And again, when it comes to that experience of how do I get into a game, a lot of games, they do this thing where you launch the game in normal mode and then you have to click a enable VR. And it's just, it's a terrible experience because you have to have the headset on. And if you've ever looked at a, just a desktop by accident with the Oculus on, or it flashes to desktop and you get that, you know, non-optimized, uh, non-VR uh, look, it just, it hurts your eyes. So we found a way, you know, if you're, if you're developing in Steam, um, you can just pop a uh, dialogue that'll hook to the launch of the game and say, hey, do you want to launch with dash VR? Let's do a little quick button here that says play with Oculus mode or play regular mode. And then you can at least, from that point hitting play, put on the headset and never have to take it off, never have to do anything else, and at least you have that smooth experience. So uh, at the time of developing uh, Oculus, there were some VR setbacks, and so here's some of them. Um, so there's a lot of friction when it came to uh, playing and buying VR content. It's like where to find it, what to do with it, how to actually get it to run. Um, the other one was we got a ton of support requests, a scary amount considering how many VR headsets were out there. And it's like, oh, this doesn't work, or this doesn't quite work like this. Um, it was a little bit scary for us. Uh, in the DK1 version in particular, the resolution display is really low. Um, motion blur is bad, latency is bad no positional head tracking. In this game in particular, you always want to move your body to avoid something, and it just doesn't work. And even though I even know that it won't work, I still do it. But the interesting thing is that a lot has changed since then. So in the announcements in CES and uh, here at uh, Steam Dev Days, um, Valve's talking about uh, better ways to uh, interact with um, Steam in VR. Uh, the actual SDK is getting a lot better. Uh, with Crystal Cove, the resolution's getting better, motion blur is going down, latency is going down, and positional tracking actually exists. So that leaves us with one thing, and it's actually building good VR content. So as Palmer was saying, the good stuff is not going to be the ports. Uh, it's going to be that original content that can only be done in VR. So what genres will, are, will flourish? So some genres that we think will are exploration games. Uh, this is you're slowly moving around, you're taking in the environment, um, you're actually experiencing it. So the image there on the left is an interesting one from Half-Life 2. This is right at the very start of the game. There's some interesting architecture, and if you look through this glass out into the world, it's behind you and up in uh, the start of Half-Life 2, and I realized that I only experienced that when I put VR on in Half-Life 2 the first time, because you actually look around. Next is racing games. People have been trying to do this forever with all these multi-screen displays. Um, being able to be in a racing game and look over your shoulder to see if a car is, how close a car is to you is, is crazy important. Uh, I mean, by the same token, space combat games are going to be huge. It, it solves that HUD problem because you just put it on your console. Horror games. So, yeah, you're moving around slowly, but you can't look away. It's just visceral, right? And it, it's going to be incredibly huge uh, in VR. FPS reimagined. So everybody I ever talk, I'll talk to, they're like, I can't wait to play an FPS in, in virtual reality. I have to explain to them that 
it won't be like any FPS that you currently play. There's just a lot of problems, like uh, running at 30 miles per hour, that you don't do that. I don't jump in the air and spin around. Well, Palmer tried, um, but I don't do that. Um, and and like in the Tuscany demo, for example, if you have a little bit of motion sickness, moving up the stairs is a really bad thing. We need to think a lot harder about what would make a good FPS in VR. And you know, I'm pretty excited about some of those genres and what people will do in that space, but I think what I'm most excited about is the invention of new genres that never would have existed without this new form factor. So, mind blown. Thanks, guys.